Thank you for joining us for the Wednesday, August 11th, 2021 environmental board meeting. Um, due to the virtual format of today's meeting, I'd like to start by providing some guidelines. We have participants attending by computers and others who may be attending by phone. For all meeting participants, please speak clearly and pause, pause frequently. State your name each time before speaking. Mute your microphone when not speaking. And if you're having technical issues, try joining the meeting using a different device, such as a smartphone or tablet, or use the call in information in the meeting invite to call into the meeting. With those kind of guidelines, um, we'll start by looking at attendance. And as Megan had indicated earlier, Danny Madden is not able to join us tonight. She's got an excused absence. And we're you and Sura. Oh, sir, yeah, I'm not gonna. Bola Probata, and am I close? <laughs> um, is here at, as a youth member, and Laura Libico could not be here. She has also has an excused absent, and if Janet joins us, she will be a regular member. With that, do you want to start the roll call for us, Megan? Please. Yes, um, Tom Anderson. Here. Saria Bola Pragada. Here. Nancy Davidson. Here. Jamie Finch. Here. Cameron Fisher. Here. Rishi Hazra. Dan Hintz. Here. Don McWilliams. Here. Ann Newcomb. Here. And Janet Wall's not here, so we'll have Tom serve as the alternate this evening. Great. Okay, so now we've done the call to order and the board minutes. Uh, before we get into um, the approval of the minutes, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how we speak and um, participate in the meeting today. Um, if you Desire to speak, please send a chat to all panelists and type question or comment. And then um, I will acknowledge you to before you prior prior to your speaking. Please do not put any substantive comments in the chat. Um, if anyone's on the phone and it doesn't appear anyone is, um, we will check with you to see if you have comments, but you can also press star three and Megan can call on you. Um, with that, we're going to move into the approval of the minutes. And the first thing I'd like to consider is the minutes of the July 14th, 2021 meeting. Um, does anyone have any comments on those minutes? Seeing none, the minutes are approved as written. Um, moving to the minutes of the July 22nd, 2021 meeting. Are there any comments or questions on those? Seeing none, we'll consider those approved. Um, moving to the minutes of the July 28th, 2021 meeting. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, those minutes are also approved. Um, moving on to agenda item number three, which is public comments. Uh, do we have anyone on the phone, Megan, for public comments or should I? We do not have anyone on the call this evening for public comment. Should I still read the guidelines just in case? No, that's okay. Okay. Um, with that, um, we'll move right into the agenda items. Um, the first agenda item is the meeting the re to review the environmental neighborhood meeting checklist. And Lucy Sloman is the planning manager and will be presenting that for us. Thank you, Lucy. Everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, by the way, um, some of you are aware I have a very noisy phone. So um, uh, I may have to ask you to speak up um, or let me know if it's disturbing any of you. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Chairperson Davidson uh, identified, I am from Community Planning and Development and I am the planning manager. And I'm here to talk to you about the environmental neighborhood meeting checklist. Uh, the meeting's purpose is now that 
Community Planning and Development, or CPD, has held five environmental neighborhood meetings. We are here to talk to you about the list tool and how it's working and to get your feedback. Um, I'm going to provide some background and then we'll dig a little bit more into the checklist itself. Um, on October 26 last year, the river and streams board was dissolved and the environmental board was established and the environmental boards. Um, objective was around environmental stewardship, including protecting, preserving and enhancing the natural environment and advising the mayor council and city departments on plans, policy, regulations and programs. Uh, rivers and streams, along with other duties, reviewed individual projects. The environmental board is not reviewing, reviewing individual projects where you were asked to look at higher level policy and plan implications gleaned from those projects. And, um, but to maintain community input. All level two or higher land use permits with critical area studies go to an environmental neighborhood meeting. Let me dig into some of those pieces a little more. So the purpose of the environmental neighborhood meeting is to give the community an opportunity to understand proposals and to provide the city with thoughts and concerns before a decision is rendered. Um, so you know, we've referred to level 2 permits and above level 0 through 1 are the kinds of permits that are shown on the right permits, signs, accessory dwelling units, certain kinds of shoreline permits, lot line adjustments. Level 2 through 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 6 um, land use permits. Uh, there are examples shown on the left. Examples I've shown level two through level five are the ones that actually took place in our five first environmental neighborhood meetings. And um, when we have a level two through level six permit that has critical area studies, then we have to hold an environmental neighborhood meeting. The council uh, approved the ordinance that established the environmental board. There were two um, documents attached to the agenda bill. It was the neighborhood meeting handout, um, which we just call a handout. It's prepared before the meeting, made available to the community. They have essential information about both the project and its critical areas. The natural environment checklist. Um, is prepared after the meeting, it's sent to the environmental board as well as whomever is the decision maker, summarizes what happened at the meeting, and then provides information that could contribute uh, to your advising on plans, policy, regulations, and programs related to environmental stewardship. So, um, when uh, part of the code that was adopted. Uh, in establishing the environmental board essentially said there should be this test period. So after there were five uses of the environmental uh, checklist, um, we asked that staff meet with the environmental board to see how, how it was working um, as a tool to inform you. Um, I've taken um, this is a version of the slide that you received, or the diagram you received, I'm so 20th century sometimes, um, of the diagram that you received uh, in your packet. Um, I've marked it up a little bit more, um, just to it's a little more detailed tool. Um, the critical areas that we regulate are shown in the tan box in the upper left. Um, there are, we start with development projects um, and one question is, do they have critical areas and is a study required? Um, if a critical area is present and a study is required and it's level two or above, then it goes through a process where they submit, uh, the applicant submits the critical area study, the city, 
selects a consultant to do peer review. Um, at some point, usually early in the process, we hold the neighborhood meeting and prepare the environmental checklist. And then these materials are sent on. Uh, the environmental checklist obviously comes to the environmental board, but it also goes to the de decision maker and the various decision makers, depending on the level of land use permit, uh, are shown in this sort of brown box. So there, as I mentioned, there have been five uh, environmental neighborhood meetings. Um, this chart uh, added a summary of those meetings, uh, the permit number, the permit name, the level of review, uh, whether the project was public or private, types of critical areas that were present in that project, meeting date, number of attendees. Uh, when we looked at those, um, what we could see is that every level of land use permit from level two to level five had taken place. And that's kind of notable because level five permits or master site plans don't actually happen very often. This is the first one we've had in about four years. Um, although the um, any land use permit that was a level six, um, which um, had a critical area study would come to you. We don't really anticipate that we will have critical area studies. Um, these are typically level six is typically annexations, rezones, land use amendments, comp plan amendments. And those typically don't have the critical area studies. They typically happen with the next land use permit. Uh, we've had a wide range of um, projects as well in terms of being both public and private. Um, all the different kinds of critical areas that we regulate were um, present in one or more of the permits. And we had a wide range of attendees from three to 36 people. Some of the uh, options that the board can consider um, relative to this checklist tool is to either keep it the way uh, it was originally provided um, reviewed and reviewed by the council, or to identify changes or additions to the checklist so that it would better serve you. Um, some of the considerations would be what would make it more useful um, in helping you to advise, um, what information would uh, help you identify and inform um, you on issues that can adversely impact the environment, and is the information um, that you think you would like to have available in critical area studies and project information? And if not, what level of information would uh, of effort would be necessary to collect that information? Um, this is just for our future discussion. These are the topics that are contained in all the checklists um, that you received. Um, I just put this together so it was an easy reference point um, when we got to discussion. Our next steps are that um, collect your feedback uh, on the checklist. Um, based on that feedback, a CPD will revise the checklist for its use in future uh, environmental neighborhood meetings. We don't have any scheduled. But there are several projects on the horizon that we uh, anticipate will need one. Um, we're required uh, and would want to uh, return each year to discuss the checklist as a tool with you. And you may very well want to meet with your uh, liaison, which for now is Megan, um, to discuss the content of the five checklists, consider how they might shape. Um, either general amendments to codes in the city or specifically um, Title 18, which I know you are um, deeply involved with as well. And that's the end of my presentation. All right, I don't see anyone up for questions. Is it uh, Megan, can you see any others? Uh, okay. 
Well, I'm going to start with my first question since I'm having difficulties typing and, and then I'll go to you, Jamie. Um, this is Nancy Davidson. I'm the chair of the environmental board. I apologize for not starting with that. Um, I am curious, Lucy, I could not figure out who you all reached out. What's the neighborhood considered that's invited to the neighborhood meeting? Um, I couldn't figure that out in reading all these. So, um, we, uh, use the noticing requirements associated with a public meeting. And so what that means is that any property owner within 300 feet, uh, receives a, a mailed notice any uh, parties of record, people who have commented or expressed an interest in the project would re uh, receive an email. And we also, um, I believe it's posted to the neighborhood uh, page on the city's website so that anyone who um, is, follows the activities in that neighborhood would be aware. I'm going to ask a couple more follow on questions that go with this just and then I can turn this over to others. Just um, as I read through these, I was trying to get context on how. Um, basically that vested each of these property owners are by the time they fill out this checklist or do the neighborhood meeting. Um, you know, where are they in the land use process? It's not very clear to me if they have or if the city's already agreed that if. Um, one of them was short planning two lots into 20, if I recall, and are they now vested for those 20 or is it 18? We could talk them down to 18. Just kind of some context would help me, Lucy. Thank you. Um, so vesting is a really tricky question and um, that usually is left to the city attorney. So I'm going to use different words. Um, so I, I will say that. What we want to do is um, we generally hold these early in the process. So uh, not long after they have submitted and um, given us their critical area studies, we would tend to schedule a neighborhood an environmental neighborhood meeting. However, um, they, um, in the case of these five projects, some of them we're very far along in the process because of uh, just the coincidence or the uh, unrelated timing of when the ordinance was passed and where they were in their process. And generally, pro procedures are not vested. Um, and so when this happened, if they hadn't already gotten a land use decision, they had to go ahead and go through this step in the process. But I do think that what you're asking um, is important um, that uh, it is happening early in the process, which means that a lot of things haven't been worked out. We may not have finished our peer review, um, which means that there are still corrections and changes and um, evolution and refinement that's going to happen in this project. And the idea is to have this conversation early um, when things can still be shaped. Okay, and I just have one last question. I'm sorry, and then I'll turn it over to other people. I'm trying that, but I knew that there were several parts to this. In reviewing the submittal provided by the school district regarding their parcel, I noticed that um, for some reason it didn't describe uh, Laughing Jacobs Creek. And um, what can we do I guess the question back to you is how can we get that so that that's actually discussed in the environmental materials for it? Because I'm familiar with that creek and recognize it is a resource in the city and a real creek. So just asking a question for generality is because I felt like it was really missing in this. So um, I'm not an expert on these projects. I'll say that first and foremost, but my um, one of the challenges with this is we're looking at the critical areas within the property and um, Lapping Jacobs Creek is not within the property. Now, there are obviously um, uh, potential offsite impacts. Um, that, that is, I think, what you're referring to. And um, there is, um, There's definitely been discussion uh, of Laughing Jacobs Creek and um, 
how this project interacts with it. But I think that the purpose of this is really at, at least where we are now is to look at the critical areas within the site um, or ones that could be um, uh, impacted directly by the project. That's all my questions. Okay, Jamie, please go ahead. Thank you. Excuse me. This is Megan. Um, Lucy, if you could stop sharing your screen, maybe it looked like you stopped sharing part of it, but I'm just seeing black screen oh. and then we'll be able to see each other's faces. Here we go. I clicked twice. Sorry. Great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Jamie Finch speaking. Um, I had a few questions. Uh, how I know it's early, but how would you say the participation of the public at this format versus when it was a part of the Rivers Stream? How did those compare? Well, that's uh, it, it's not only um, probably not apples to apples because it's a different board, um, but it's also not apples to apples because it's virtual versus in person. And, um, you know, I think we're all very curious to see um, what the changes may be um, in terms of um, <clears throat> whether we go back to a hybrid model or a person model. I would say um, Cameron may have a perspective on this as well. Um, I, um, from the projects I saw at Rivers and Streams, Many times we had no one but the applicant and their consultant team, but there were certainly times when we had a full house and had to drag all the chairs out of the storage room. And so I would say in that sense, it's probably not that different. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, and then is it safe to assume that now that the Rivers and Stream Board is not a part of the process, it's kind of down to the public? Because I know a part of the Rivers and Stream Board kind of mandate was providing some tech, like some relatively technical feedback. Is that now sort of falling to the public in a lot of ways, whoever attends? Oh, no, I, I would say um, what this really reflects is the evolution of the city's resources. Um, when, uh, you know, I, I've been with the city for a long time, but not as long as the Rivers and Streams Board has been around. So, as I understand it, um, Rivers and streams, river and streams was created um, to provide technical resources because when it was established, the city was small. It didn't, uh, you know, everything was just done much smaller and there was not the kind of technical resources that we have now uh, with critical area studies that we receive. As far as I can remember, every single one of them, we, um, the city hires at the applicant's expense a peer reviewer of our choice to provide the technical expertise we need to evaluate that. So we are not looking to the public. I mean, we welcome any perspective that they provide, but we are not relying on the public to provide that technical expertise. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Understanding the difference in, in resourcing the city was that was a great answer. Um, Two two additional questions. Um, I know some of the applications or the uh, checklists seem to have like some fairly substantial details that were not confirmed at the time. Is there any touch point with the public after later in the process on some of those projects where those those details might be confirmed? Um, that's a great question. <clears throat> so I would say um, the level two projects um, would take more effort. Uh, on the community's part. Uh, level two projects um, require public notice and there would be, um, there is a comment period that's associated with them, but the decision is made by staff. And so there wouldn't be a public meeting or a public hearing at which people could um, rejoin, you know, to comment or learn more. Um, however, um, I think three of the projects that were shown will have a public hearing. And so okay. now that these people have commented, um, they would um, be parties of record and receive notice and be able to receive the staff report, attend the meeting, ask more questions. 
Um, the other thing I would also add is that um, the city and and I, I think some cities do this, but I know we've been doing it for a long time. We have what we call the active projects page, and that is um, a public facing GIS page on which permits that are in um, construction or land use review or under construction show up on a map and people who want to get more information can see many of the key drawings and documents that are submitted. So if someone, <clears throat> uh, because this is in an early stage, we're likely to get more submittals, updated critical area studies, revised land use permit uh, drawings, and someone who was interested could, um, uh, you know, check that page and see when new submittals come in and then add their own comments. Uh, that does okay, take so a little that, more motivation. So it sounds like it's for the project of a certain level, the public hearing is really that opportunity for the most part. Is that? That's the easiest one. The, there are yeah. certainly, I mean, we take comment all the way up until a decision is rendered, but we're um, not pushing as much information out for the level two permits as we would be for the level three and up. Okay, awesome. Uh, and then my final one, um, I think a lot of where I can see potential value for these checklists is the act, like aggregating some of the, the, the outcomes and the, the critical areas that are being impacted. Are there any plans to across projects or say for a year, aggregate the results, like the, the, not the, the critical areas being impacted, how people chose to, or did not choose to mitigate, um, or is it really each one of these checklists supposed to live in isolation? I'm unaware that we're aggregating information at this at this point. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, I think probably one of the most the nicest coincidences of the uh, bringing this to you and giving you an opportunity to see things is that Title 18 is currently under review and we are really looking to this update and our consultant team to improve our um, uh, critical area regulations and protections. Um, I'm not sure that that means that we should be aggregating information that that would be a separate conversation, but I think we're gonna have much more up-to-date um, protections that will be available. Great. Thank you, Lucy. Mm -hmm. You're on mute, Nancy. Sorry. Dan has a follow up. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Uh, Dan Hintz. Um, yeah, I was kind of kind of along Jamie's lines. Is it is it required to provide like, let's say, the acreage of category three wetland that's going to be impacted or acreage or length of stream stream buffer kind of along the lines of trying to figure out what the kind of total impacts are, um, I, like I see at least the designations in the example that was in the packet, but nothing on, you know, specific area or acreage <clears throat> or stream length. Um, I don't think that we have specifically gotten it that way, um, but I think that's a, that's a good question of whether that um, would be a piece of information that, um, the board would want to know and, you know, to that question of the effort. Um, the city uses a um, permit review, <clears throat> excuse me, program called Bluebeam, which allows us to scale things and measure areas. So that seems like um, something that potentially wouldn't be hard to do um, as long as we can figure out how to do it consistently and in a meaningful way um, for the board. Are there any other questions? Don, go ahead, please. Hi, Lucy, Don McWilliams. Just one for clarification. Um, is this in addition to the SEPA checklist that these folks are required to do, or is this separate from the SEPA checklist? 
John, I can just barely hear you. I don't know if it's my fan or your um, computer or an unfortunate combination. Could you say that again, please? Let me try that again. Can you hear me better now? Yes, I can. Thank okay. you so much. Um, noting the SEPA checklist that the state requires, is this, is this in combination with the SEPA checklist? Is it part of it or is it standalone as its own critical areas checklist specific to ASAP? That's a great question. So, um, let me just um, give a little bit of an introduction to this. So, SEPA is the State Environmental Policy Act. And for projects over certain thresholds, um, an applicant is required to submit a SEPA checklist, which um, evaluates a project on, say, let's say 16 different uh, categories. And um, and then the staff use that to um, evaluate the project and determine if there are any um, significant adverse impacts that are not being otherwise mitigated through, for instance, existing regulations. Um, so I think the thing I, I would say is these, these maybe that's an unfortunate choice that they're both called checklists because they're two separate checklists. Um, the process that we're going through with the environmental neighborhood meeting uh, and uh, the products that we're creating from those meetings, the checklist that's going to come to the board. Um, one of the key things is to try and make give the, the community an opportunity to tell us if there's something maybe about the area that we don't know. Um, you know, is there some endangered species or something about the site that maybe uh, your average uh, uh, consultant who's coming out to the site for the first time might not know about. And then the information and comments and questions and concerns that are raised by the public are then folded into um, the critical area study. You know, we may go back to the their consultant and our peer reviewer and say, we want you to check this out and find out if this is in fact, true or not. And, um, you know, as I described, um, the peer reviewer and the applicants consultant team go back and forth until um, the uh, critical area study meets the city city's requirements and then it's considered approved. And that's a tool that approved critical area study is a tool that the city uses in deciding what conditions um, need to be applied through SEPA. So it's more a linear process than um, a combined process. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that does. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions from the board? Okay, at this point, uh, I'll open up to comments. Does anybody have any comments um, on the checklist and how it's being used? Jamie, go ahead, please. Thank you, Nancy. Jamie Finch speaking. Um, I think my one direct answer to the questions that you posed um, was, I think it would be helpful, especially as, as we look back at the end of a year, to identify the number of comments that were received for a certain, like beyond just the number of attendees, any specific comments that were submitted as well. I don't know if that's in currently included, but I think it would be helpful to identify where there was controversy or something else that we should be in particular looking at a given project. Uh, Could I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so, um, right now I'm doing this from memory, but I believe what the checklist shows is the number of attendees and the number of written comments are so are you referring to written comments or are you thinking about spoken comments uh written and i think i must have missed that in the checklist because that was there because that was okay i think if you there that was yeah fair enough um there was a lot to look at i think if you if you found the place where it gave the number of attendees that first paragraph, you know, is like number of attendees. And then there's another paragraph before it goes to a different category that I believe says how many written comments were received. Okay, I'm seeing that now. Thank you. Okay, great. I just wanted um, to make sure I was tracking. 
Yeah, and, and I think overall, um, and this relates to my last question that I asked, I do think, especially for what we're being asked to do is to try to advise at the policy level and throughout a year, there's going to be a, a large number of projects, a large number of outcomes. To me, regardless of what is in the checklist, and I, I think I have less comments there, um, it seems like a lot of the information we would need. I think the ability to understand the higher level and, and being able to aggregate um, what has happened across the year um, to help us understand how certain critical areas are being impacted, et cetera. And I'll just provide an example, which I'm probably going to misspeak a little bit here, but just of what I would hope to be able to like provide comment on at the end of the year. Like, for example, we had in 2021, there were 15 level three permits of which five impacted wetland areas, let's say. Of those, three used buffer averaging, one used reduced the buffer, buffer through some means that would be detailed, and then one left the buffer unchanged. And I, I think being able to understand like how people, like if we're advising on policy, understanding how people are, how many projects are actually uh, like relevant to something that we might be working on, then how are people actually reacting to the options that they're given? So I think questions that within the, the um, checklist, and I think a lot of this is captured that really make it clear uh, and easy to report on of like, this were these were the options that, that that applicant had, this is what they selected so that we can understand at the end of the year or whatever time period, um, how are people using this and then try to understand the, the long, the, the impacts from that. But that's really, I think, the most key thing for me, because I think it's going to be really difficult for our board to get into the detail of any single one of these individual checklists, um, unless there's something that's a huge outlier with tons of comments that we should be aware of. But I do think for us to really be able to advise well and, and, and be informed over some period of time, making the questions and the feedback that provided easily aggregatable and something that the city could consider providing that as, as a report out to the environmental board at the end of the year. So, in in uh, just to make sure I'm tracking your your comments, what I'm hearing is that chart that I provided in the memo, expanding that to um, not just list the critical areas, but for instance, provide some information about um, impacts, actions, um, not in any kind of detail, but to provide that sort of overview context of um, what, uh, I, I, you know, as you said, uh, what options did the applicant have and what options did they exercise? Um, yeah, I think that's also, a good. You would also like some context of how many of those, say, level three permits had critical areas and how many didn't, so that you have a sense of where to focus. Just have some context for what you're looking yeah, at. Yeah, I think that's that's really in the end. It, we might decide, like, if there's a certain thing that is way higher incidence than everything else, maybe we should be, like, evaluating that portion more with more detail. So I think that's where some of this reporting would help us not only provide good feedback, but also know where to dive in deeper and, and, and how we should be thinking about something uh, maybe differently or at least looking at some more of the detail. Yeah, and that, no, that's a great point because, for instance, with, when we were working on the Shoreline Master Program update, there were some things that we were considering changing, but no one had exercised those incentives in 10 years. And so it wasn't a good investment of trying to consider changing it much because it wasn't something that we were seeing a lot of interest in. So thank you. That helps. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. I want to add on. There's two of us that want to add on to what Jamie just said. So, Lucy, in as I considered this, I would love to see the city come up with a report card at the end of the year that says that we lost, you know, five acres of wetlands. I'm just using that, or ten trees of certain diameter, and we, um, you know, replace them with this. So, at the end of the day, since we're talking about climate change and impacts to the environment, we can actually get a scoreboard or a report card, because we have to give a report every year. And it's very hard to do this with very the subjective information we're kind of getting. But it would be really nice if in these if the applicants would tell us how 
much wetlands they're doing, how much they're replacing. So we can say, or, you know, enhancing or buffering or whatever, but it, help, it would help us provide a report card to the community of how we're doing on the environment, particularly in light of the climate change initiatives we're trying to do along the way. Um, and I know there's others that want to add on to Jamie's comments. Do you have any questions for me, Lucy, before I turn it over to someone else? Um, no, I, I, I think, you know, what I'm hearing is some of the um, stuff in the checklist is um, tangible, but it's not numerical. And and so it's hard to get a sense of the actual impact. So I, I understand what you mean by report card and so forth. Okay. Um, and Don, you had some additions that you want to add it to Jamie. So I'll let you go ahead, please. Yeah, just real quick, Lucy. Just something for consideration well into the future. Um, for your GIS team, it would be great to be able to see this visually somehow. Um, so year after Can year. Can you speak up well. again? I'm sorry, I'm really having a hard time hearing you. I don't know what's going on with my mic today, sorry. Um, it would be great to see this visually somehow, maybe in a GIS format. So year after year, be able to monitor the effects of development in Issaquah and you know, what are we losing? What are we gaining? Um, those type of things. All right, with that, we're going to go back to Dan, who had a comment. Go ahead, Dan, please. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, Dan hints again. Um, I guess I have a comment and maybe a question on kind of 2 areas in the checklist. 1 is kind of following up on my question in the uh, previous part of this conversation. Um, even going a step above, I was asking specifically about, like, you know, square footage or acreage of, of wetland impacts or stream buffer lengths or, or things like that. Is it actually required as part of this checklist? I'm, I'm looking at the mine hill um, example and in the project description, it provides, you know, class 2 stream class uh, 6 stream category 3 wetland, you know, moderate coal mine hazards, steep slopes. Um, and I was wondering if that was just, you know, additional information provided for this specific project or. Um, if that's actually required to have some of the, you know, kind of category listings for the critical areas. Um. So, that's a great question. We typically need the classifications of the critical area because that's how we know what buffer is required sure. and how to evaluate um, that particular critical area and whether it's being impacted or um, you know, protected at, mm -hmm. as required. Um, so, but I don't think, so the, the, the classification, uh, you know, uh, I, I know Dan, you know a lot about this, but you know, wetlands, it's often, there's habitat scores and there are all these factors that come into determining what the appropriate um, buffer is. Um, some other critical areas, it's much more straightforward if it's class, Two, it's a buffer of Y, and then you can make a request if you meet certain criteria, at least under the current code, to um, get reductions. Um, if you were asked, so that is part, that is an essential part of what we get. I don't think that we typically uh, get the kind of information that you were mentioning, such as square feet or acres of impact or enhancement or uh, length of stream that's being impacted or enhanced. Mm. I don't think we tend to get that numerical information. Um, but as I said, I'm not sure that would be um, as long as we had a consistent methodology. So we were getting um, meaningful information. I'm not sure that would be too hard to um, okay. request. Okay, that's great. I mean, I guess that's my comment then. I, I would, you know, personally like to see, um, you know, I don't even know in the specific critical area, a little checkbox if, you know, yeah, some, some of these I'm less familiar with wetlands, you know, we have our four categories. I know for Kara and Isaqua, I believe there's a few different classes. So I feel like a few of them might be more straightforward in terms of some specific um, classification or um, categorization of the critical area. So I guess personally, I'd like to see that as a requirement. And instead of just acknowledging that they're on site, I'd be curious what the actual impacts are so getting kind of into some of those metrics um so that's that's kind of my one comment on on the specific critical area information list there um in some of the um beyond code compliance and critical areas 
Um, and this might be more of a conversation for Title 18, but um, as a, um, you know, big uh, supporter of the urban canopy we have here in Issaquah, um, I, I do think it's, it can be a little misleading on this total caliper inches of significant trees. I'm not sure off the top of my head what is defined as a significant tree. Um, by doing this 30% threshold, you know, it leaves a lot of rugger room to keep some of the smaller significant trees and get rid of, you know, older or certain species that are much harder to establish on site. There's also no guidance on, um, you know, once again, going back to the actual areas of impact, if you're keeping 30% of your total caliper inches on site, you know, you could theoretically be losing 100% in the critical areas is, is my assumption I'm making, but uh, that kind of goes back to, I guess, my first comment of just having some better ideas of the actual impacted areas. So, um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and see if other people have. Well, let, let me add a little bit about trees, um, because I think that's, um, um, that's a sort of our next bucket of Title 18 work that's coming up. Um, uh, I know we're working to figure out um, the environmental board's role with other buckets beyond the first one, which you were involved with. Um, there are specific caliper inches. I believe it's six inches for most trees and eight inches for um, like cottonwoods and alders, I believe, um, that you have to be above that to be considered a significant tree. You, uh, the tree retention cannot um, count anything in critical areas or their buffers. You're already required to protect that, so that's completely off the table. Um, and the other piece, um, there was another thing I was going to say, but I would also add that um, tree canopy is separately evaluated by the city. Um, the parks department does that. I'm not saying it's not relevant to this. It's absolutely relevant to the work you're doing. Um, it's just not something that CPD does. It's just that the actions that take place in our um, department are essential to that. And um, that is, I think, something you'll hear um, many Dollywall talk about when we talk, talk about the goals and outcomes for Title 18, because um, maintaining tree canopy was certainly one of the goals and outcomes established by the council. Um, but that might not be, um, different neighborhoods might be handled differently because different neighborhoods have different land uses, have different amounts of existing trees. So there's a lot of discussion that we're um, looking forward to having around the trees. All right, thanks Lucy. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm up next. I'm Nancy Davidson, and I just have a couple of comments on uh, the neighborhood uh, meeting information. First of all, when looking at the information, it appeared there weren't a lot of maps trying to give you context of where we're at and where the critical areas are. And um, for the public at large, it would be nice to have maps of the site and the critical areas on that site that, that have been identified. Um, I just think it's better information. Uh, the second piece that I would like to add is that um, Offsite impacts, I think, is something that should be considered. And that's, I know, a huge can of worms to open up because uh, everything flows to Lake Sammamish here pretty much. And, you know, so you can always say you're impacting Lake Sammamish. But um, I would just ask you to consider offsite impacts because, you know, stormwater or, you know, impacts to wetlands affect people downstream or trees do as well. And um, it seems very, limiting to just focus on the critical areas on the site. And I think we're not doing a good job if that's all we're doing. Those I've already provided com my other comments elsewhere under Jamie. So I'll move on to others. And next we have uh, Don. Did you have any more comments, Don? I know you wanted to speak. You're good. OK, next we have Cameron. Cameron, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Nancy. Uh, Cameron Fisher here. Uh, just a uh, Follow up to to Dan, uh, your your question and comments uh, to to Lucy about uh, including acreage or, or stream length uh, in, in the documents. Um, from from my experience and what I saw on the the rivers and stream board when I sat on that, um, the the critical area reports typically would identify the the resource, the critical area. Um, however, ob obviously some of it. Uh, so for example, a wetland would extend off site. So to get an accurate um, 
uh, sizing of the wetland um, in, as, as an overall is, is uh, somewhat impossible, though they could identify what's in on the uh, the site as well as similar with the, the stream length. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, um, the, the focus more from from both the city, but also from the state and, and the federal level, uh, the Army Corps or ecology is what is the level of impact associated with the, the, the development onto the wetland and how are you going to mitigate that if it's restoration, uh, um, you know, enhancement or whatever it might be. Um, so, so that's really where the, the, the square footage or the acreage or the, the linear foot uh, of that critical area comes into play. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Does anybody else have any comments at this point in time? Excuse me, this is Megan. Um, I saw Anne. I think you sent something to me privately. Did you have a, a comment that you meant to send to everyone? Thanks. I, this is Anne Newcomb here. Um, I, I changed that, so <laughs> that won't happen again. Uh, Nancy uh, keeps um, taking care of all my questions and comments. So mine was just going to be about the downstream effects. And in this case, it would be. I think mostly downstream effects of water runoff. Great. Is, is that all that you have, Anne? Yeah, and you had already talked about it, so it was a Thanks. redundant. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, Jamie, go ahead, please. Thank you, Nancy. Jamie, thanks for being super quick comment. Um, I know in the Title 18 meet, meeting that uh, we had with Minnie and the rest of the team uh, a couple of weeks ago, one of the things they mentioned was some was kind of a rating scale for, and I don't know exactly what it was going to be called, or like a sustainability score for a project. So I, I just think as we figure out new things through Title 18 or that that process or anything else, we might just think about including those into into this checklist. So that don't know what that's going to be, but. Does seem like something would be relevant for us to take a look at. In this right, you faded out there at the end, at least for me. Um, you you mentioned the rating for sustainability, and including that in the checklist. Was there more that you were saying, Jamie? I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss it. Yeah, it was it was only mentioned at a super high level, and I'm trying to remember the exact details, but. I don't know if many has, has has something to add, but I know there had been discussion of a more comprehensive uh, scoring system for development projects. Um, many, do you have? I saw you just came on video. Do you have more to add? I just can't really. Sure. Exactly. Yeah, I think it was related to the sustainability discussion. Whether um, is you know there were two approaches that we build in the sustainability in each of the individual Title 18 chapters, or we create some kind of a uh, a point system to say, uh, you know, you may need to meet so many points uh, for you to do this development and you can do it by a menu of choices, you know, from rain gardens to uh, green roofs to whatever the, you know, is assessed in terms of the importance and that's tied in with the climate action plan. You know, the policy level work will occur and then that'll inform what that rating system or point system, if that's the choice, uh, it's what should go in. Um, but in terms of the wetland and the stream impacts, you know, great discussion. And uh, I, I think it's important to figure out what would we do with these performance measures? Um, you know, and having a synthesized, uh, you know, what I heard was individual reports are good, but they're not giving you a, a, a picture overall at the scale of the city. Um, so what you're seeing now is a slice of things that are happening to the critical areas as they relate to development. In addition to the development, there's the restoration that's happening. Uh, Dan gave us a great tour of, of the work they've done uh, on Lake Sammamish State Park. Um, so it's, a, you know, these tools and this checklist is actually just showing you what when development occurs, what what is impacted. Um, and when we issue them an approval, uh, so the different stages of review. So what when, when this checklist is prepared, it's early in the in the project. 
We are trying to solicit and be transparent with the community of here's a project going on. If you know of any information, uh, you know, we're trying to solicit information and preparing this checklist. By the time it gets to an approval stage and we issue them an approval, we do capture some of those things. So if there is an impact to the buffer, there is a code requirement that they have uh, one to one ratio, or if they're filling a wetland, it's one to 12 ratio. So we do capture that in our findings of the total impact and what the mitigation was done. And it doesn't stop at that point after the decision is made and they do the, the mitigation on site. They're required generally to monitor it for 5 years. Sometimes when it requires a core permit, they have to monitor it for 10 years. So you can't just plant and walk away. You have to make sure that the plants thrive and you know, you give them the, the care it's needed for it to become uh, a successful mitigation site. So there are those kind of measures that are done over a longer period of time. Um, so I think as as you as a group think about and you know, like Lucy said, the timing is great because you're seeing this and you can use this information to inform what you want the code to say. Um, if we want some information from the applicant as part of their application, we can require that. Uh, you know, typically, I mean, what type of wetlands, what kind of uh, stream uh, that will be that is generally always included in the critical areas report. Square footages uh, of impact are usually included. The total square footage of the entire stream stretch, probably not, and, and I'm not sure what we would do with that information either. Um, if you're after in terms of the total score a report card overall for the city, um, then you need to take into account the stuff that happens with development, but that stuff that happens with environmental stewardship program, you know, through the city, through Mountains to Sound Greenway Trust and other organizations that are doing fabulous work within our region. Um, and some of that collection of data at Wire 8 uh, may also be occurring. Um, and Department of Ecology even goes broader and they look at the state of affairs at a state level. You know, and generally, as development and uh, occurs, there is more impact. And and in case of Issaquah, it, you know, all of that impact is probably already, uh, you know, it, it's a developed site. So a lot of these um, critical areas are already within close proximity of development, makes them even more valuable because they provide a better function for flood storage and and other things that um, make them even more, you know, even though the cat categorization may be not as good because they're, um, you know, full of blackberries or whatever the case may be, but that they're providing that function um, to a very high level. So that's sort of my takeaway from listening to this great discussion. Thank you, Minnie. Yeah, I think my changing a little bit what I had said before, I do think that we might want to revisit this checklist after Title 18 is done, uh, just because a, a lot of the decisions on what's important and kind of what we're doing will be made during that process and you may just want to check back in on how that might impact what information we want to track. So we will be back annually. So that's a good thing um, to be able to revisit this as we're learning more with Title 18. Um, two pieces I wanted to add on because Minnie brought up some really good points. There's only so much that we know at the point that we're doing the environmental neighborhood meeting. And so we will have a more sort of general um, level of information, preliminary level of information at the time that we're doing the checklist that's the report out from the environmental meeting. But then we could do that kind of scorecard for things that have gotten far enough in the process over that year to um, give a picture. And that, but that may not match up one to one because. Um, if you're doing something at an early point in the land use process, it may not sync up. It may not m get through that by the time we're reporting to you. But um, I think the other piece I, I thought about this a little bit, and and I think another piece to think about is this checklist and the reports that we're providing to you annually is not the only piece of information. And I think that that you're going to have to rely on as part of the work that you're doing. And, you know, some of this, um, Minnie brought up a lot of great projects um, 
Dan's project of restoration, the envir city's environmental stewardship program. I think that there's a whole number of um, groups and entities and actions that the city's taking that our piece is only one of those of a greater collection. And I think that that will be a great thing. Um, not that we could ever replace Megan, but whoever um, attempts to fill her shoes, um, that will be a great thing to work with them on in terms of identifying the different work that different departments is do are doing, the kinds of reports they could provide, and how to pull that together to give um, the kind of holistic picture that, for instance, Don and others were referring to, um, to understand that. Because I don't think that the report out from the checklist is likely to meet all of those needs. Great. Great. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Um, we had one question from Janet. Janet, would you like to, can you move her up so we can get her question asked? Megan? Janet, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, uh, I have been advocating for years uh, about recognizing uh, wildlife, uh, the importance of wildlife uh, uh, corridors. And I'm glad to see that there was some mention of that. I'm, I'd be interested in knowing how they propose to identify these corridors. And I was puzzled when in the talk about um, stream buffers, it indicated that um, if they were, um, the stream was a recognized wildlife corridor, the buffers could actually be reduced. And I would think that mm -hmm. you would want the opposite. So I think that's going to be a big part of the Title 18 work, Janet. I um, know that you and I've had that conversation and I think we're very happy that that's part of the um, responsibilities or scope that our consultants are working on and would certainly be something that um, this board would have an active role in reviewing and discussing. So I, I think that uh, we know that we need to address that. And I think the question of whether um, buffers get reduced if you provide a wildlife corridor is a great policy topic for the city to take on as part of that. All right, at this point, I'm not seeing any other questions from or comments from the board members. I'll just quickly check in one last time because we have other interesting topics to get to tonight. Seeing nothing at this point, Lucy, thank you very much for your um, detailed and very good presentation and description of your work. Thank you. Hopefully you got the feedback you were looking for. Absolutely. And, all right, moving on to the next agenda item, which is the overview of Title 18 goals and outcomes. And uh, Minnie Dollywall is here to present that. Go ahead, Minnie, thank you. Thank you, Chair, um, and good evening, everyone. I'm going to try and pull up um, a PowerPoint here. Megan, can I, when I click on share, can you make me a presenter? Yes, let me do that now. should be able to present now. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Right. So, um you know, uh, when we did the whole deeper dive into the environmental topics on July 22nd with the combined planning and policy commission and environmental board, um, you know, it, it we became to came to us that we've been bringing uh, a lot of this information to planning and policy commission in terms of the overall arching 
picture for Title 18 code update, but we hadn't come to environmental board. So thank you for the opportunity tonight to uh, walk you through. Uh, it's um, So we want to kind of make sure that everyone understands what this Title 18 code update is. Um, so land use code is really a range of development regulations. Uh, at the end of the day, these regulate how the land is subdivided, how it's used, how it's developed. Um, so within the overall um, Title 18, there are multiple uh, chapters. Zoning, you know, what is allowed in that piece of property, how, how big the lot sizes can be, and what kind of um, uh, frontage it needs to be, critical areas, you, you took a deeper dive in that, um, landscaping, what is the design of the buildings, um, such as height, parking, and then how do we actually process our uh, land use applications when someone comes in to develop their piece of property. So that's all part of this whole Title 18. Um, a little bit of background for a city of Issaquah, uh, you know, it was first adopted in 1996 and then a lot of development occurred through development agreements like the Issaquah Highlands, the Talus development, and then over the years, it became uh, a patchwork of ordinances as those development agreements um, expired, they became replacement regulations, but there wasn't an opportunity to do a comprehensive combining of the code. And so the city council formed the land use title 18 ad hoc committee. It's made up of uh, three council members at the moment, uh, council member Goodman, Walsh, and and uh, Council President Hun, and uh, they were tasked to identify stakeholders, uh, recommend a project scope, a public engagement plan, and uh, to make recommendations on the policy decisions for this code update. And then on April of this year, a city council awarded uh, the service contract to the consultant team, which is led by uh, BHC, but as you saw and heard from a number of consultants, there are some very technical items. So we have a consortium of, of uh, consultants with their expertise in a particular area. Um, a little bit about what's the framework of land use uh, regulations. What, you know, how do these come about? And these are very legal regulations that can be challenged in the courts. So, but there is a framework that we, we have to evaluate and adopt these under. So at a much higher level, there's the Growth Management Act, which came into effect in 1990, and it promotes uh, smart growth, sustainable development, all the things that this board uh, really cares about. And then the Vision 2050, which is Puget Sound Regional Council actually um, comes up with and does forecasting for this whole Puget Sound region, looking ahead for the next 20 years, 40 years, and 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 really says this is a region is going to grow by so much number. How do we accommodate this growth? How do we preserve some of these other things and still be in compliance with Growth Management Act? And that informs the countywide planning policies at the King County level, which then informs the local comprehensive plans. So for the city of Issaquah, we have to be in compliance with all the all these underlying things, the Growth Management Act, uh, Vision 2050, countywide planning policies, but then the community gets to choose how that all fits in with the vision they have for their own individual community. Um, and those long range plans then inform these land use regulations, which are the implementing tool to get the, the vision that the, the, the city and the community desires. A little bit about growth management planning. Like I said, it encourages smart growth, sustainable development. There are these 13, 14 goals. Um, urban growth uh, needs to be in places where uh, it can be supported by um, uh, service. Uh, the, there is a general rule to reduce the sprawl uh, that's expensive to deliver the services, uh, is destructive to critical areas, um, so there is an urban growth boundary that uh, all of the growth is supposed to occur in um, for our region and Issaquah kind of straddles that boundary very closely. Um, the transportation, you know, the growth management encourages efficient multimodal transportation um, for housing, a wide variety of housing um, and encourages affordable housing for all segments of the population economic development, so it's consistent with the resources and facilities throughout the state. It also requires us to protect 
property from arbitrary and discriminatory actions um, and uh, and issue our permits in a timely and administer our permits in a very fair manner um, and so on. I mean, there's the open space and recreation areas need to be preserved, protect the environment, um, encourage citizen involvement in the planning process. Um, also, some goals about historic preservation and shoreline, um, which in the city of Issaquah is the Lake Sammamish and also um, the Issaquah Creek and the East Fork. Um, so, at the state level, there's some guidance to uh, on how some of these regulations for each city uh, cannot be so unique and different that there isn't an overarching goal for preserving the shoreline. For instance, um, subdivision is a statewide um, uh, requirement. Critical areas need to be updated every uh, eight years uh, just because the best available science sometimes changes and we learn more about how things are um, Things work, um, and then in terms of uh, our city, what some of the goals and policies are adopted in the strategic plan, in the comprehensive plan, and the old town sub area plan. A significant amount of work occurred with the central Issaquah plan. It was a public process and engaged community and, and adoption by the council. Uh, you all may all have your fingerprints on some of these uh, long range plans uh, through your participation on either the board or as, as citizens. Um, park strategic plan, um, mobility master plan, and uh, more recently, the work that uh, you all are doing on the climate action plan. Um, so then in addition to these long range plans, city council worked uh, at the end of last year or fall of last year to come up with what are some goals and desired outcomes for Title 18 update. So they looked at these um, long range plans and the community's aspirations for our city and identified these 13 goals. And so I'm gonna go through these um, you know, one by one um, and details of this packet were included in your packet, um, but protecting forested hill sites which is a land use policy goal in the comprehensive plan and also in the strategic plan. Um, providing adequate parking while using the land efficiently. Um, conserving and protecting environmentally critical areas from loss and degradation. Enhancing wetlands and riparian corridors to improve fish and wildlife habitat. Uh, improving public awareness of development and construction activities. How do we do the public outreach? How, who all do we notify um, and things of that nature? Increasing housing diversity um, to have a wide variety of uh, housing options for different people in the community that some may desire larger homes, some may desire townhomes, others may desire more uh, uh, cottages or accessory dwelling units. So, ha you know, a, having a more diverse housing stock. Um, ensuring uh, that the city retains 50% tree canopy. Um, and then uh, moving on, uh, the neighborhoods retain their charm and distinctive character. This was pretty loud and clear in the strategic plan. And uh, how do these uh, land use regulations get us to uh, meet that goal is sort of the task in front of us. Um, across the city, there are public amenities. Um, but at the end, the community desires to have a very livable uh, community. Um, ensure that the new development um, is sustainable and meets the climate goals. Um, there's effective management of travel, both in terms of non-motorized transit and climate goals. Um, also, it successfully implements the park strategic plan and the green necklace. And sign code has all the work on that is almost concluded. Uh, Lucy Ware has worked really hard on it, and I think it's right. Um, Planning and Policy Commission has concluded the work, and Council is um, at the point of adopting uh, pretty soon. Um, and then lastly, is modernizing the code and incorporating best practices because our code is a patchwork of or, you know ordinances. It's difficult to use. It's spread out in multiple areas. So th those are sort of the main three, 13 um, goals and outcomes that the council desires uh, and the, through the community input. And then 
Planning and Policy Commission looked at these 13 goals and they had some uh, minor edits that we've captured in the packet that you have as the last page. We've added some additional um, details that they desired uh, to be uh, included in these 13 goals. Um, as you're probably all are familiar with strategic plan, um, but it, it, there is a chapter on growth and development. So we'll be looking at that. There's a, there's a section on environmental stewardship that we're looking at to identify where the gaps are in Title 18 that don't uh, that are not in sync with some of these uh, longer uh, policy goals. Comprehensive plan uh, has a land use uh, element, uh, housing and transportation. So we're going to be looking at where the gaps are from what the the adopted plans are to where the Title 18 is. Um, so, you know, for some of you that may not have be familiar with, um, but I just picked one example where the, what what is a land use goal and what's a land use policy. So at the goal level, it says enhance the natural systems from potentially negative impact. Um, the policy says that that is in sync with that goal is to say encourage efficient use of land by allowing clustering of buildings within development. And then the title 18 uh, will take those things to say, what does clustering mean? You can only cluster if you have a critical area and you're preserving, um, you know, the buffers for that, uh, for that wetland 100% or 75% or whatever that is. So it gets to the next level of detail for as an implementation of those goals and policies. Um, here's another example. Uh, so central Issaquah plan, which is our long range plan uh, establishes some of these goals, a livable, sustainable, compact urban community. Pedestrians are a priority. Uh, we have a balance of mix of uses. Um, and then um, title 18 is actually going to implement those and create those in a more tangible form. What those uh, regulations mean when someone comes in to develop their piece of property. Um, and so the overall title 18, we've, we've, for the purposes of this update, we have categorized them into 6 larger groups. Um, so natural environment that you took a deeper dive on July, uh, July 22nd includes the aquatic critical areas, uh, steep slopes, um, and, and we had uh, lighting shoreline setback and sustainability under that category. Um, we have landscape and open space. Um, which we are looking at the park strategic plan, green necklace, uh, open space standards, landscaping chapter, trees, tree chapter. And we've identified that we would uh, have planning and policy commission work with uh, parks board on the, on that, those topics. Then the next three are zoning and uses, um, building and design, and development standards um, and those uh, we've identified uh, that planning and policy commission will work uh, jointly with the development commission um, before finalizing their recommendation to uh, city council and lastly is really the procedures how do we process these what kind of public notice do we provide so and some of these other miscellaneous uh, topics so that's sort of the overall um, groupings that we're considering. Obviously, what we heard loud and clear was that the groupings under natural environment were too many for one group. So what we're doing now is looking at some of these other groups and trying to split them into two or three if needed. Um, so like I shared with you, the central Issaquah plan, you know, more broader policy uh, things, and then it comes down to Title 18. What does parking regulations look like? If uh, the goals are to minimize the presence of parking, the Title 18 will say it has to be behind the buildings or it has to be um, a separate material for distinction between your walkable surfaces and your parking areas. Um, you screen these by some landscaping and what the square footage of that landscaping means. So it really has to be more um, uh, not an arbitrary and a broad goal and, and title 18, it gets to a level of detail that then can be implemented at a site design and uh, that staff can use to uh, either approve or condition uh, a proposal. 
some other examples for circulation. What does it look like if pedestrians are a priority? You know, how do these uh, sidewalks um, um, include landscaping or surface change or and, and things of that nature? So it gets fine grained in terms of the, the regulations at Title 18 level. Um, so when we uh, just to kind of because you don't see it and um, you know what a project looks like when someone comes in to develop a piece of property, they prepare the site plan. They show where their parking is going to be, where the buildings are going to be, where the landscaping is going to be. If there is a critical area, they show us that and they show us the buffers. Uh, if they're staying completely outside the buffers or are they asking for some deviation from the standard buffer as such as buffer averaging? Um, and so on and so forth. And the process includes we first have a very preliminary uh, you know, meetings with them, then they submit their application, then we do these neighborhood meetings, then that informs our review, and some of these things then get approved by the Development Commission. Then we issue a notice of decision and send it to them. It gets circulated to everyone that has expressed an interest in the project. Um, and then it can be appealed if uh, if someone uh, thinks that an error was made. Um, and after all of that land use process is done, and then comes the actual construction permits, that's when they can actually uh, get a permit to build. Um, and then we start the inspection program, making sure that they are meeting the life safety standards, and that's a whole another code, which is the International Building Code, and the fire department reviews that, and that gets to a whole level of detail uh, that's much more fine-grained than the land use detail because they're looking at, do you have enough doors to get out of the building if there's a fire? Well, how long do you have to, you know, uh, between the two doors and things of that nature? And then after all those inspections are done by the building department, fire department, all the utilities are in place, the water sewer, that's when they get their occupancy. So that kind of completes the full circle of what um, a development means from point A to point Z and where we are in terms of, um, you know, looking at these codes and regulations and doing a more comprehensive look for, um, um, for all the land use regulations. And that's the task ahead of us uh, uh, that we're bringing forth some of the expertise from the consultants, giving you the information. And I realize we are giving you a lot of information, but, um, and which can sometimes be overwhelming. And we can, based on feedback we've received from the community members, from the chair, from some of you that have taken the time to write to us, uh, we are adapting uh, to what will be more meaningful dialogue uh, with you. Therefore, we we're here to talk about this global larger context to give you a more feel for what the Title 18 update is. And also, uh, we've sent you a survey after the July 22nd meeting uh, on the topics that we, we shared with you uh, on that day. And then we are also scheduling a meeting on August 26th to continue that discussion on the topics we covered on July 22nd with Planning and Policy Commission and all of you. So that concludes my, uh, you know, sharing of information, but I'm here to answer any questions or, uh, or take any more feedback you have for us. Thank you, Minnie. This is Nancy Davidson, the chair of the committee. Um, that was a great presentation and an overview of Title 18. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, board members, do you have any uh, questions or comments for me as we move forward? Uh, Jamie, go ahead, please. Thank you, Nancy. Jamie Finch speaking. Thank you, Minnie, for coming back and, and responding to my emails. Appreciate uh, your thoughtful response. Um, in one of those emails, you had shared some of the, uh, you shared the top level goals um, of it during your presentation, but in, in that email, you did share some more kind of like more granular goals within some of these areas. Um, is that something that we'll be able to discuss at all? Or is that is that still in process with some of these other, the, the reviews from the other, the Planning Policy Commission and the other boards that are taking these other areas? 
Yeah, so I think um, in my email, I shared more of a schedule of how we're breaking up these six buckets. So that's still a work in progress. I think we're going to uh, ask planning and policy commission for, um, and that's really adapting to scale it down per, you know, topics per meeting. Um, so, so those were some of the things, but I'm, I'm not sure if we, if I shared anything in terms of goals, um, but those are the, the ones that we included in the packet are the goals and outcomes that the council had. And then the planning and policy commission had some edits and, and some finer detail that they wanted to add. So, um, that's sort of the overall, uh, picture. I can pull that up a uh, chart if that's useful, but, um. But really dividing it up between, we want to make sure we are capturing feedback from a lot of community members. So, you know, and finding that balance without overwhelming all of you with the entire Title 18. Um, we thought maybe the environmental topics would be more of interest and expertise that you would bring uh, to the discussion and maybe educate uh, the rest of the board, you know, board members on, on your expertise and those. Um, if, uh, some members of this board desire a more involvement in some of those other topics that are with the other um, board members and planning and policy commission. Um, then we can discuss that what that form format looks like, but uh, the planning and policy commission, you know, under the state law, the cities have to designate who's going to. Uh, make a formal recommendation to council on these land use regulations, and that's the planning and policy commission. That's the city's charter. They, they, that is their mandate to, to they have to do that in order for our um, department of commerce and others to, to see that we are following that process. So that is their role to make a formal recommendation to city council. Obviously, we feel that this is such big of an undertaking that it involves a lot more boards and. And we want to have the conversations in a more fruitful uh, manner. Um, so we're open to if you think uh, there is more interest in other topics beyond the ones that we covered on July 22nd from you all. Thank you, Minnie. Yeah, I, I don't remember where I, I might be misremembering that. I thought I remember seeing some like high level goals that I don't know if it was PPC or that initial um, the group with Council President Hunt and the other kind of sub. Committee, if there were some high level goals for some of these categories, might be misremembering. Because um, I do think, totally understand that we, you have to divide and conquer on all this detail, but I do wonder if there's, I know I personally think that there's a lot of topics within like some of the other areas that are very, very, have a high bearing on the climate action plan, our impact going forward within the community, how sustainable. Issaquah will be in the future, how easy it will be to make Issaquah sustainable. So I might just be misremembering, but I do think that I would potentially advocate for maybe not the detail, but is, if there was some, like, some overall goals for these areas, having the ability to comment on those would be a valuable opportunity. But uh, thank you. Yeah, so um, I, I think there's the, um, so, the goals for the overall title 18 is, I think what we've shared uh, in your packet, uh, then for each subtopic. So, even under the natural environment, say the wetland, what we shared with you on July 22nd is a code update memo that looked at where the gaps are and what our proposed approach is. So, you know, if there's feedback into, is this proposed approach? Um, going to get us these broader goals and outcomes that uh, uh, the community desires is I think uh, that closes the loop in terms of how what would what would be helpful for us as we lay out the proposed approach and get feedback from all the boards is to see if if the proposed approach is actually going to meet the go the broader goals and outcomes that we shared today and in your packet. Um, Thank you. That's you reminded me where I had seen. I knew I'd seen that somewhere. So, um, no, that that all makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments from any is on this? No questions. No comments. Well, I think I I can ask a question if you uh, are okay with it, Chair Davidson. 
please go uh, forward. So August 26th, when we bring back um, the, uh, the topics that we discussed on July 22nd, is there something that would be useful for you all in terms of the format? I mean, we can keep it open ended. I think we've done enough talking. I think at this point we want to do the listening from you all and have a co fruitful conversation between you and the planning and policy commission. Is there, you know, do you guys want to, is, if there's someone has an expertise and wants to take a little bit of time kind of sharing some information, we can build that into the agenda. I know I'd picked on uh, Dan during our tour and, and uh, asked him if he would be willing to talk to others because he knew all about plants and wetlands and streams and, and everything else. So, but if there's other expertise or how, how do we structure or do you, what can we give you to, to help you, I guess, is sort of the question I had, or if there, if we should put the agenda where you all um, have a certain time to share your wisdom and with the rest of the planning and policy commission. I'm just looking for some ideas for how to structure August 26th to make it meaningful. Great and Don has a comment on that. Go ahead, Don, please. Yeah, I do. Thanks, Manny. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. That was very helpful. Um, with regard to your question, looking back at the last meeting, it was it was somewhat overwhelming. Um, there was a lot of information there in a short period of time, and I didn't feel that I had the time to pipe up and make comments and ask questions to get clarification during that. So, um, depending on what you're covering, try to be specific on your ask of us, and I, th I think we can address your questions just fine if we have specific asks of us, but an open free for all forum, if you will, may not be the best approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other comments from uh, the board? Well, you're not getting a lot from us tonight, Minnie. You know, as the night goes on, we get a little quieter. So it looks like uh, Jamie had a comment. Jamie, go ahead, please. Thank you, Nancy. Jamie Finch speaking. Um, Two things that might be helpful, and this goes back to what we were talking about with Lucy earlier, is I do think there's some topics that get used a lot or that have a lot of potential usage going forward. So I do think if there's anything you can provide, like, I don't know, Lucy had an example of something we hadn't seen used in 10 years, maybe we shouldn't be spending as much time. And I think for us, it's a little hard at this point to know where are the meatiest topics that we should be spending the most time and having the most discussion on? Um, and I do think one other idea, and I don't know exactly what this would look like, but I do think before we dive into some of these natural environment topics, it might be helpful to have our board, it, it, you'd have to come up with the right question, but sharing our overall goals or hopes and desires for this land use update, anything that we might, again, I don't know how you frame this up, but there might be some benefit since this is the only time that the, the planning policy committee is gonna be talking to us. If there are any broader perspectives um, or goals or hopes that, that we went, might be able to share those before we dive into some of the more tactical topics. Okay, great. Does anyone else have anything to add? Okay, at this point, I'm going to end this uh, part of the agenda. Minnie, thank you very much for your presentation and discussion with us. It was great, and we look forward to hearing more on, I guess it's August 26th, correct? That is correct. Great. All right, great. With that, thank you again. Nancy, and... I do see one more comment that just came in. <laughs> Hi, Ann, why don't you go ahead, please? Sorry about that, I was doing all panelists. Um, so, I was gone last time and I did listen to the marathon meeting. Um, I did think it was really uh, informative and I think it. I'm really proud to be a part of a city that is so forward thinking and thinking about the environment and I think you guys are all doing a great job. So, I just wanted to say that. Um, and then there's one thing that keeps popping out at me, which is I've seen that you want to keep 50% of the tree canopy. I've seen that a couple times, but in um, the um, the ICAP, we are planning on 100%. <laughs> so 
that it might be something that needs to be addressed. Sure. I'll, yeah, so, um, you know, it'll probably be in our tree chapter. Um, so, I, um, and that's going to be discussed with the park board, but I will make a note of that to, to see. Um, you mentioned um, in your uh, climate action plan. You, yeah. You, yeah. Thank Anybody you. else? Any other comments? Okay, thanks again, Minnie. And this uh, agenda topic is now concluded, and I'm going to move on to the reports. Uh, Megan, go ahead if you have any reports for us. Sure, thank you. And I just want to make one comment. Um, we are still in the drafting process for the climate action plan, so we're still discussing all of those goals and metrics. So um, there's been conversations about that, but nothing has been um, uh, determined in that process. So just wanted to mention that. Um, so I do have a couple uh, updates this evening. Uh, so the first is on the climate action plan. Uh, so this board last saw that in July. And since then, we've been doing a lot of public outreach. Um, we had the community convening on climate at the end of um, at the end of July, and had uh, great attendance in that. Uh, we also went to the Economic Vitality Commission. Um, I'll be talking to the Planning Policy Commission tomorrow, and have a couple focus groups as well. So we're really gathering input from a lot of different sources right now to help inform um, where we want to go with that plan. Um, so I did want to mention that we also have a survey out to the community right now. Uh, so anyone who's watching, um, it'd be great to have people fill that out. That's on our city's website, as well as having board members fill that out uh, as a way to give additional input as well. And that will be open through August 20th. We also have that translated uh, into both Spanish and Mandarin. So if you have any resources for helping to get the word out about that, that would be greatly appreciated as well. Uh, the next topic I wanted to mention uh, is we've had a few questions about the overall meeting um, hybrid in-person conversations. Um, so our council did have their, their first hybrid version of that. Um, and there'd been some discussion about whether we want to roll that out for boards in the fall um, due to increases in the Delta variant and, um, and the status of coronavirus now, that's been delayed till at least November 1st. So we will be continuing the virtual meeting format at least until then before going with any hybrid uh, formats. And the last thing I just want to mention was just an update on the sustainability manager position. Um, so as you all know, I will be ending my role with the city at the end of this month. Um, so we are in the process right now of interviewing and um, selecting someone to come on board. Uh, so they should be on board. Um, hopefully, you know, soon after I depart, if not some crossover, uh, but we'll definitely let the board know as soon as we have that person on board and that will be the new staff liaison. So we'll be sure to get some introductions um, and be able to get that person up to speed on all the great work of the board. And I think that's it for my report outs. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. And I'd just like to add, I did participate in the final interviews for the last two con candidates. So. Um, there are some good people on the list. Just wanted to share that. Any questions or comments? Okay, what's the next agenda topic is, sorry, I lost my calendar. Thanks, Let's Anne talk about a question. It. Oh, Anne, go ahead. And did you say the survey is due on August 20th? Correct. Climate action plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, great. and I can, I'll say I'll send that link out to the board um, again so you guys have it. I've been circulating it. Do you know how many responses you've gotten? Last I heard today, we have 161. So great response so far. Well, cool. so let's keep it up. Great. And our next meeting, Megan? Yeah, so next meeting, as uh, Minnie 
referenced will be on August 26, and that will be the joint meeting with the Planning Policy Commission. Um, so that will be a Thursday, not a Wednesday, uh, but at 630. Um, the following meeting after that, we also are changing the date for that will be September 15th instead of September 8th. Um, so I reached out to everyone. I think I've heard back from most folks about your availability for those two meetings. Um, if you have not had a chance to let me know, that would be great uh, just so we can track that. But that meeting on September 15th will be for um, to review a draft of the climate action plan. Great. Any other questions or comments? Anything for the good of the order? Seeing nothing, have a great evening. Thank you all for participating and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Meetings adjourned. Take care. Bye-bye.